Friends of Elephants event for the month of April. Uh, I welcome all the attendees and uh, my name is Aksha and I'll be the MC for today's event. Before we start, I request all of you to follow certain do's and don'ts for the event. Uh, firstly, I request all of you to please keep your videos off at all times. Secondly, I'd also like to request you to keep yourselves on mute to maximize bandwidth. And in case you have any questions, please feel free to type it out on the chat box and your questions will be addressed at the, uh, in the Q&A session after the talk. So without further ado, I'd like, uh, I'd like to introduce the event. Uh, let me share my screen. So this is the Friends of Elephants event of the month of April 2021. Yes. So Friends of Elephants, what is it? Friends of Elephants is not an organization and is not proposing to become one. It is an informal group of people coming together with varied expertise concerned about elephants and other wildlife. The group is a forum for disseminating knowledge linked to elephants and other wildlife science, conservation and welfare through art, culture, literature, movies, talks and panel discussions. Our expectation is that people who have attended our events conducted at this capital city on their own or with their proximity to the people from policy making, help in developing appropriate conservation and welfare measures for wildlife, including elephants. So uh, for this month, I'd like to go over the schedule. So first we have, uh, so the title of this month is Bhutan Elephants and Tigers, Conservation from Himalaya's Eastern Edge. The first, uh, the first event of our, um, the first uh, topic of our event will be a talk on protected areas and elephant conservation in Bhutan by Mr. Sonam Wangi, followed by a talk on non-invasive technique of monitoring tigers in Bhutan by Mr. Tashi Bhendu. Then we have Dr. Arun Venkatraman in conversation with Mr. Sonam Wangi and Mr. Tashi Bhendu on what Bhutan teaches on elephant and tiger conservation to Asia. And in the end, we have a question and answer with Mr. S uh, Sonam Wangdi and Tash Mr. Tashi Dendo, which will be moderated by Uncle Shetty. So before we begin, uh, what is this event about? So I would not waste time talking about what this event is. Rather, I'd like to say that uh, while being at the comfort of our houses, today we have an opportunity to explore the treasured landscapes of our friendly neighbor, Bhutan. Bhutan has set an example for the world in terms of its environmental protection, with 51% of, of the country under legal protection, as well as econo socioeconomic development, where the gross happiness product is one of the key determinants of progress. I'm delighted to introduce the first speaker, Mr. Sonam Wangdi, for this event. Mr. Sonam Wangdi currently works as the Chief of Nature Conservation Division under the Department of Forest and Park Services of the Royal Government of Bhutan. As the chief of this division, he oversees the conservation programs in Bhutan, both within and outside of Bhutan's protected areas. He is responsible for technically advising the protected area system of Bhutan that includes five national parks, four wildlife sanctuaries, one strict nature reserve, and also the network of biological corridors that interconnects all these areas. He is also responsible for giving policy guidance on conservation and protection of nature in Bhutan. He additionally holds the charge of program director for Bhutan for Life Project, a USD 43 million innovative financing program for sustainable conservation, financing of protected areas for a period of 14 years that started in the year 2018. So, Without further ado, I'd request Mr. Sonam Wangdi to please take over. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you, Aksha, for introducing me. Uh, 
It's a great event, uh, and I feel privileged uh, to take part in this event uh, virtually from Bhutan, although I would uh, always love to visit Bangalore. I have been there once uh, uh, by the invitation of Professor Raman Sukumar, whom uh, most of you must be knowing being uh, elephant lovers. So uh, like Aksha said, uh, without further ado, I would like to straight away go to my presentation and then introduce uh, the projected areas of Bhutan and uh, elephant conservation in Bhutan. How do we actually do the elephant conservation in Bhutan through this system of protected areas? Yeah, uh, is my screen visible to everyone, Aksha? Yes, your yes, screen so is visible. visible. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you all. And then uh, I, I could see uh, there are almost close, uh, more than uh, 70 participants uh, listening to my uh, presentation today. Now I would like to, at the outset, I would like to thank uh, the Asian Elephant Specialist Group uh, through the invitation of which uh, I am participating in this event uh, today. And special thanks to Sandeep uh, Tiwari of Asian Elephant Specialist Group. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so my talk is about the protected areas and elephant conservation of Bhutan and the waterfall that you see, the beautiful waterfall. It's called the Twin Waterfall and it's in one of the most uh, oldest uh, national park, uh, the Royal Manas National Park that uh, adjoins uh, India's Manas National Park or the Manas Tiger Reserve in, on the Indian side. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> so how do we actually uh, protect what we are protecting today? Uh, Akshay has already introduced that Bhutan has more than 50%, uh, more than half of its country under the protected area system. So what are the various tools that we have uh, in order to protect uh, this uh, landscape as the protected area system of Bhutan? The, the guiding uh, philosophy or the policy that we have, uh, that uh, the unique development philosophy of the gross national happiness uh, where environmental conservation is one of the pillars uh, of cross-national happiness. And uh, very interestingly, we do have a commission that is dedicated to uh, ensuring uh, that this policy is followed through. No, uh, uh, whatever projects or whatever uh, activities that is undertaken in, in Bhutan is screened by this commission and uh, using the cross-national happiness tool. Uh, and environmental conservation through in. <clears throat> okay, uh, so how do we actually uh, uh, ensure environmental conservation or the protected areas uh, uh, through individual ownership or the institutional responsibility? The responsibility that we have at the moment is given to the forest department or, or the environmental uh, sector in, in general and uh, we have the constitution of uh, the Kingdom of Bhutan, where we have uh, one full article that is dedicated to environmental conservation. And Article 5.1, it says that every Bhutanese is a trustee of kingdom's natural resources. And it is the fundamental duty of every citizen to co uh, contribute to the protection of natural environment. So it is not just uh, the responsibility of the concerned agencies that uh, I mentioned the forest department or the uh, National Environment Commission to protect the uh, kingdom's natural resources, but the constitution mandates each and every one uh, uh, of the citizen as, as their fundamental duty to contribute towards the protection of natural environment. And Article 5.3, uh, which, which has been replicated from the uh, uh, Forest Act of the 1960s, uh, the uh, Act, that was promulgated in the 1960s, early 1960s. Uh, it uh, actually, the constitution actually says, mandates that a minimum of 60% of Bhutan's total land shall be maintained under forest cover for all times to come. And 
in terms of uh, <clears throat> the conservation, I would like to say that uh, conservation per se has not started as a new uh, agenda in, in, in the uh, government's uh, agenda. But uh, even before pre-Buddhism, that was like uh, in the sixth century, uh, even before the sixth century, we have, uh, we, the, the Bhutanists used to follow uh, the religion of Bonism, where reverence for nature and re reverence for certain elements in the nature was uh, always there as the, as the day to day element uh, in the uh, in people's life and with the coming of buddhism uh, which preaches uh, or which, which teaches compassion uh, buddhism taught the buddhists uh, to respect each and every form of life uh, uh, each and every form of sentient beings and this has played a major role uh, in in the conservation uh, in conserving the nature and then uh, uh, in what we have, uh, the pristine environment that we have today uh, is all because of uh, the com compassionate people that we have and then the uh, respect uh, or the reverence for life uh, uh, in any kind of forms. And with the coming of the monarchy in the 19, uh, in the, uh, in 1907, or even before that, uh, we had visionary leaders who uh, promulgated policies that uh, helped in uh, maintaining pristine environment and then who always recognized that uh, uh, natural environment is more important than going ahead with uh, development at the cost of natural environment. And because of which we continue to have the political will and the support that we have today. Uh, to talk very briefly about the evolution of the protected area system, how, how did our protected area system evolve over time? In the 1960s, uh, this was how the uh, protected area system uh, looked like. We used to have few wildlife sanctuaries and then a uh, few nas smaller national parks and reserved forest like, uh, uh, like uh, we all do. Uh, I mean, uh, like uh, India still uh, have the reserved forest uh, so we had a few reserved forests, a few wildlife sanctuaries and national parks. And in the 1980s, uh, this was further uh, uh, refined in, uh, to become the Jigmidoji wildlife sanctuary in the Northern uh, frontier. And then few national parks uh, that we had in the central part of Bhutan and a uh, few, uh, few wildlife sanctuaries and national parks towards the Southern uh, part of Bhutan. And uh, in the uh, early 90s, uh, we revised the protected area system uh, 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 to represent uh, uh, the biodiversity that we have and the eco uh, to have equal uh, ecological representation in every protected area. Uh, uh, the in the 19, uh, early 90s, uh, we revised the protected area system. And in 1999, uh, the Bhutan declared a network of biological corridors as a gift to the earth from the people of Bhutan. Uh, and rightly so, in 2005, uh, UNEP recognized Bhutan's uh, and awarded the champ, uh, Champions of the Art Award to Bhutan. And in 2006, uh, WWF uh, awarded uh, the King and the people of Bhutan, uh, the J. Paul Getty Award for conservation leadership. And in 2011, uh, as recent as 2011, His Majesty Jigme Singh Wangchu for his efforts uh, that, uh, because of which we have the current protected area system and the environmental conservation and the uh, unique development philosophy, uh, philosophy of gross national happiness, which, uh, uh, gave the importance of environmental conservation even when going ahead with the developmental activities. So he was rightly inducted uh, into the uh, Kyoto Earth Hall of Fame. Uh, okay, sorry. Uh, and in 2008, uh, coinciding with the 100 years of monarchy as a tribute to the uh, Wangchuk uh, dynasty, 
we declared the largest national park, the Wangchuk Centennial National Park, uh, that was declared as a tribute to the monarchs because of their uh, uh, their originally uh, because of which I mean the uh, their original leaders we have the protected areas and the uh, conservation that we have uh, today, and in two thousand eight, Aksha uh, <coughs> uh, was uh, already mentioning that I also uh, uh, held uh, I, I also hold the additional charge of uh, being the program director of Bhutan for Life. We. Uh, initiated the Bhutan for Life uh, program, uh, which is an innovative sustainable financing, uh, conservation financing, uh, US, uh, the 43 million uh, US, uh, 43 million US uh, dollars uh, uh, project that was initiated uh, for the, uh, as a con uh, innovative conservation sustainable financing for the protected areas. And in 2020, in order to meet uh, the current demands and uh, to stay relevant to the current times and situation, we started redesigning our national pro uh, protected area system uh, in terms of uh, the, all, uh, the uh, uh, redesigning using the latest technology, we uh, started redesigning the national protected area system. And in uh, 2021, which is uh, what we are doing today, we are moving, uh, we are even looking beyond uh, our protected areas and taking conservation beyond the protected areas through the concept of key biodiversity areas and then uh, high conservation value areas. So this is what we have today, uh, the beautifully designed uh, the protected area system that uh, started as early as 19, early 90s and uh, went, uh, went on, uh, modifying till 2020, uh, and this is what we have at the moment. So we have the network of uh, biological corridors, the yellow uh, uh, thin, uh, line, thin patches of land that you see, the, those are the biological corridors. And these are uh, designated in order to provide connectivity and genetic flow within the, uh, from the protected areas uh, into another protected area so, so that uh, we don't conserve our protected or, or, or we don't conserve our protected area system as an island uh, protected area system. In order to give interconnectivity between the protected areas, we designed the uh, biological corridor system. And uh, uh, which is uh, uh, the topic that is of relevance uh, today, uh, we have one mic site, uh, the monitoring of, of illegal killing of elephants site the, uh, in the south, the western part of Bhutan in a place called Samsi. And exactly what are we protecting in this uh, protected area system? I would uh, uh, do, like to show you picturally as, as high as uh, 7,000 meters above sea level, we have the snow leopards, uh, the uh, national bird, uh, national bird uh, the common raven, the national animal, the uh, Bhutan takin, and we also have, interestingly, we have recorded the Royal Bengal Tigers as high as 4,000 meters above sea level. And in the temperate, uh, mid-temperate zone, we have a um, few uh, species. Uh, the bird that you see here, the heron, is the critically endangered uh, white-bellied heron. And the bird, beautiful bird you see out here is the Himalayan monal. We do have red pandas. And the butterfly you see out here, it, it is our national butterfly. And, uh, it is believed to be endemic uh, to uh, the eastern part of uh, Bhutan and the neighboring areas. And in the south, uh, we do have elephants, we do have golden langurs and tigers. And these are all um, protected in the protected area system as well as outside the protected area system through uh, legal policies that we are uh, through the uh, enforcement of the For Forest and Nature Conservation Act. Just to give you a, a, a stats at a glance, uh, Bhutan has at the moment uh, 200 species of uh, mammals. And uh, in, even uh, in, in terms of mammals, we have uh, some of the uh, uh, species that has been, uh, uh, that, that we had conducted uh, nationwide surveys. So we have around 104 tigers, 96 uh, snow leopards, and 678 uh, elephants. That was, uh, uh, and all these number uh, estimates are from uh, uh, 
nationwide population surveys that was co conducted in the period of 2013 to 16. And in terms of birds, we continue to um, record uh, new records. And at the moment, we stand at uh, 745 species of birds that has been recorded in Bhutan. In terms of plants, uh, we have 5,600 uh, species of vascular plants, 282 species of non-vascular plants. And in terms of herpet fauna, which is explored, uh, very, uh, this is the least uh, explored area. And then uh, we have few professionals coming up, uh, foresters who are interested in taking up surveys and their surveys have recorded 61 species of amphibians and 126 species of reptiles. But we still feel that uh, we, we will continue to add on to this species in terms of the butterflies. Uh, because of the effort of one or two individuals who are interested in uh, butterflies. We have recorded uh, 753 species of butterflies, 100, uh, 1,145 species of moth. And then uh, in terms of fish, uh, uh, we have not conducted a full nationwide uh, uh, river and survey as such, but we have recorded 104 species of fishes in our river system. And uh, we do have the endangered uh, golden mashir uh, in our river system, uh, which is also called as the tigers of the river. Uh, coming specific to the elephant conservation, uh, I would now like to go into, uh, because uh, the uh, today's event being uh, event uh, for friends of elephants, so I would like to uh, now start talking about uh, elephants. And uh, in terms of the cultural uh, significance, uh, and which we see as an opportunity uh, in terms of conserving elephants in Bhutan. Elephants are revered as, as, as an important figure in the Bhutanese culture. And uh, the picture out you, uh, that you see out here, here it is a good luck, uh, and it, it is uh, considered as a good luck offering and very important functions. And the picture you see here uh, was taken during the crowning of uh, the current king, the fifth king of Bhutan. And uh, we offer uh, elephant as one of the jewels uh, to the, uh, whenever we have very nationally important occasions. So we got, uh, offer elephants as, uh, uh, as a jewel offering to such occasions. And wherever you go in Bhutan, you will always uh, come across uh, wall murals uh, of elephants. And uh, it's commonly uh, called as uh, four, uh, murals of the four harmonious uh, friends where elephant sits as the base of those uh, friendship and we have a monkey sitting on the elephant and we have a rabbit sitting on the monkey and we have a bird uh, sitting on the elephant trying to reach a fruit uh, uh, from a tree so this all uh, signifies uh, that elephant has played a very important role in our culture uh, and uh, in our religious system, elephant is considered as a symbol of mental strength. And it is, uh, like I said, it is uh, offered as one of the jewel elements offered to Buddhas in the mandala offering ritual. Uh, coming specific to elephant, uh, the legal, uh, like, I, like I already mentioned, uh, we have estimated about 678, very interesting number, 678 uh, Elephants, uh, the, uh, the latest estimate that was done in 2015, 16 uh, uh, survey that we conducted, uh, uh, we estimated six, seven, eight elephants. And the, to talk uh, very briefly about the legal status, it is li listed as Schedule One in the Forest and Nature Conservation Act of Bhutan, meaning elephants are given given total protection equivalent to that of a tiger, and uh, you. Uh, Although we don't have any uh, killings, but uh, this uh, act further protects, uh, gives total protection to the elephants. In terms of the home range uh, that I personally uh, un undertook and uh, undertook a study using uh, radio collars, I collared six elephants. And from those collar data, uh, I have come to uh, know that uh, the home range uh, varies between 100 to 600 uh, square kilometers. And then uh, our elephants are transboundary in nature because uh, uh, we do share, uh, uh, like Asha was mentioning, our friendly neighbor. Uh, so the next neighbor that we have is the Assam state and the West Bengal state. So we do share elephant population between these two states uh, uh, in India. 
Uh, and my uh, the coloring study that I did uh, it showed no long term uh, long uh, season mi migration. It's just a seasonal movement from one park to another in search of food and water. Uh, to very briefly talk about the prospects and challenges, uh, we through the uh, as a result of the uh, nationwide elephant survey, we have come up with the elephant conservation action plan for Bhutan, uh, and. This, has, this is already under implementation and then it started from 2018 and it is a 10 year uh, conservation plan for this particular species. And uh, this conservation plan is actually a road, uh, roadmap to secure the future of elephants in Bhutan. It uh, talks about what is needed uh, in terms of uh, giving protection to the species, in terms of giving protection to the habitat of this particular species, and what are the various challenges that we face in terms of human elephant conflict and where habitat degradation in terms of uh, providing connectivity. So uh, just to uh, give you uh, a very brief, uh, uh, the, uh, I will run through an animation of uh, a short video where uh, it shows the six elephants that I call it. Uh, the green uh, portion that you see is the Bhutan uh, uh, map. And then uh, below that is the, uh, uh, the Indian state of West Bengal and Assam. So you can, uh, just to give you a visual uh, interpretation of my call of data, it shows that uh, elephants, uh, like I said, elephants are transboundary in nature, and then uh, we need to join hands uh, in terms of uh, protecting the species, in terms of uh, in terms of protecting the habitat of the species. Uh, this particular image, uh, this will give you uh, over a decade of uh, time. Why do we need to uh, protect uh, the elephants? Uh, I mean, the habitat of the elephants. So. Uh, I, I took this uh, up from the uh, Google image and then uh, overlaid uh, the images, uh, uh, did a time lapse. So if you can uh, view this, uh, so in starting from 1996 and 1997, uh, please uh, focus on this green area that is uh, in the Indian site of, uh, uh, this used to be a very good uh, elephant habitat and we still uh, come across lots and lots of elephants in this area. This is towards the eastern, uh, southeastern parts of Bhutan, and the uh, bordering uh, state is the Assam, mostly towards uh, the uh, Tezpur uh, and Sonitpur area. So if you, 1997, 98, 99, 2000, 2001, 2002, 2003, 2004, 2005, 2006, and uh, so uh, looking at this, uh, it sh uh, shows that why we need to conserve the elephant habitat. Uh, as you can see through this uh, uh, satellite images that I just uh, showed you, elephant habitats are fast disappearing across the border and then elephants are being pushed uh, towards Bhutan. Uh, and of course, uh, when the habitats on the Indian side disappear, this I think uh, these are all, all these areas are converted into tea garden, which is not very friendly for elephants. And then elephants are pushed into this uh, areas uh, uh, towards the eastern, uh, southeastern part of Bhutan. Uh, and this is where the uh, heaviest uh, human elephant conflict happens on the Indian side. And there, I mean, uh, uh, places like Udalguri, there we do come across news uh, where there is lots of death, human deaths uh, because of uh, elephants coming into uh, conflict with humans. So this clearly shows that why do we need to uh, do a collaborative, um, make a collaborative effort, transboundary effort in terms of uh, conserving this uh, landscape so that the species is protected and given uh, a good habitat. So in terms of transboundary collaboration, you can see here, uh, we do uh, collaborate a lot with our uh, counterparts on the Indian side, mostly the state of Assam and West Bengal. Uh, the elephants that you see here was used for uh, joint uh, patrolling. Uh, we call it the synchronized uh, patrolling because uh, on the Indian side, the Indian uh, forest department patrols and then on the Bhutanese side, 
the Bhutan uh, forest uh, guys patrol. So here you can see uh, uh, out of the six elephants, two elephants are from the Indian, uh, the Manus National Park. So, uh, so what I am trying to say out here is that um, in terms of uh, Going ahead with the transboundary collaboration, you just cannot say that uh, we do collaborate uh, at the ground level, but we need to formalize this and then uh, using elephant as the foundation of friendship, we are proposing to India and uh, to the Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change that we establish uh, in this area, we establish a Indo-Bhutan Peace Park in order to celebrate the long uh, lasting peace that we had uh, over the last uh, uh, century or so uh, in order to celebrate uh, the close friendship that we celebrated, I mean, uh, we had uh, over the last many years, uh, we, if we can uh, protect this landscape and then declare it as a friendship uh, or the Indo-Bhutan Peace Park. Uh, it, so this is where uh, we are proposing uh, in terms of we already have a uh, uh, Indo-Bhutan uh, joint uh, program through the initiative of Tramka, the transboundary Manas conservation area, but we want to expand this uh, beyond uh, the areas of Manas. So this is the Manas, Royal Manas National Park, and this on the Indian side is the Manas uh, National Park or the Manas Tiger Reserve, and we have the adjoining Manas Reserved Forest. So. Uh, if we, uh, the dots that you see are my uh, colored uh, elephant data. So you can see that using elephant as a focal species or the uh, basis of uh, uh, collaborative efforts in terms of bringing collab collaborative efforts, if we can declare this area as an Indo-Bhutan uh, peace park in order to celebrate our long lasting peace and friendship, uh, we would be securing the whole of the elephant uh, habitat landscape so with this, uh, I come to the end of my presentation. Uh, thank you. And I would like to uh, pray for the safety of everyone uh, living in India, uh, uh, because we know that India at the moment is going through a tough time uh, in terms of dealing with COVID. Uh, so stay safe, everyone. And then our prayers are always with you that uh, you, we all will uh, get through this pandemic together. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Sona, for enlightening us with the current status of elephant and the uh, possibilities of conservation across the boundary. Uh, I am delighted and honored to uh, share uh, the second speaker of our event today. Uh, let me share the screen. So the uh, second talk will be uh, given by Mr. Tashi Dendo. It is on non-invasive technique of monitoring tigers in Bhutan. Tashi Dendo is a wildlife researcher at the Wangchuk Institute for Conservation and Environmental Research under the Department of Forest and Park Services in Bhutan. Over the last eight years, he has used mostly camera traps and recently non-invasive genetics to mainly study threatened species such as the tiger and lesser known small wildcats of Bhutan. He has a master's in wildlife biology from the University of Montana, US, and currently works as a senior forestry officer. Over to you, Mr. Tashi, for your talk. Thank you. Hi, am I audible? Yes, Mr. Tash, you're audible. Okay, um, and, and can uh, I hope everyone can see my screen. So yeah. um, thank you, uh, Aksha, for the uh, introduction. And uh, it's an absolute pleasure for me uh, to, uh, to be getting this opportunity to uh, talk to everyone here. And uh, today I'm uh, going to uh, give this presentation on tiger monitoring in Bhutan using uh, non-invasive tools. So um, 
in, through this presentation, I'm going to share the little uh, work that I've done on uh, tigers. And uh, I work for the Ugin Wong Chuk Institute for Conservation and Environmental Research under the Department of uh, Forest and Park Services. And uh, the institute is a research and a training based institute under the department. And over the years, um, almost a decade or so, the institute has done a, a remarkable work on uh, tigers involving camera traps. And I've been very lucky to have uh, been a part, uh, part of some of it. So, um, so as uh, Aksha mentioned in my introduction, I've been using uh, camera traps to study tigers. And recently, through my master's research at the University of Montana, I, got, I also got introduced to this uh, tool of non-invasive genetics for monitoring uh, tiger populations. So basically, the presentation that uh, I'm going to make today is, uh, is uh, the master's research uh, that I did. OK, so um, I'll jump into my presentation then. Okay, so okay. okay, so I hope um, you can see my presentation. Yes, you can yes. see your presentation. So uh, before, so tiger is, uh, as we all know, is a large carnivore and uh, large carnivores, they occupy a, cru a crucial position at the top of the food chain. But large carnivores are also uh, among the most uh, threatened uh, group of uh, animals in the world. Um, they are threatened by habitat loss and fragmentation, fragmentation by persecution, by uh, utilization and uh, depletion of prey. So tiger is a flagship species for the Asian forest ecosystem and uh, is a charismatic species. And despite you know, um, concerted efforts uh, over the last uh, three, four decades by uh, be it conservationists, by researchers, uh, be it uh, you know, countries, the species has remained uh, endangered and they continue to be threatened to extinction as a result of prey depletion, as a re result of poaching, and as a result of uh, habitat loss. So when we come to Bhutan, Bhutan is a very small country. Uh, it's sandwiched between um, China to the north and India to the south. And uh, we cover just 0.03% of the world's surface area. But uh, despite uh, the small size, uh, we are uh, incredibly biodiverse. So we are part of uh, the Eastern Himalaya biodiversity hotspot. And uh, as mentioned uh, previously by uh, Samsar and Aksha, we have 72% um, of the country under forest cover. We have more than 51% uh, of the country under protected areas. And despite the small size, like I mentioned, just 0.03% of the world's uh, surface area, but uh, we are home to 200 species of mammals and then 740 plus species of birds and counting. And we are also home to almost 30% of uh, the all wildcat species that are found in the world. And we are also home to approximately 100 uh, tigers. So the tigers in Bhutan can be found uh, all the way from uh, 100 meters uh, in the southern part of the country to about uh, 4,000, uh, um, above 4,000 meters in the north. So in 2015, during uh, one of our camera trapping surveys in central Bhutan, we recorded the tiger at an elevation of about uh, 400 and 300, uh, 4,300 meters. And then uh, some of our team members, they found uh, bug marks at uh, 4,600 meters. So um, the tigers are found at various uh, elevational range within the country. So they also uh, are an integral part of our religion, our culture, and our traditions. So tiger conservation in Bhutan started, um, I think, um, by the late 1980s when the department first started uh, monitoring tigers in Bhutan by using questionnaire surveys. Then th that evolved into um, using science surveys to monitor tigers by in 1998 and by the late 1999 and, and then the early 2000, um, the camera traps came into the scene and then the Bhutanese researchers here and the foresters and the department, they started using camera traps to monitor tigers. And uh, 
they are listed as a, a Schedule One species, a totally protected species under the Forest and Nature Conservation Act. And the first nationwide tiger survey was uh, done uh, in 2015, and the report came out in 2015, and uh, it estimated 100, uh, a little more than 100 tigers with the density of about uh, 0 0.24 tigers uh, per 100 kilometer square um, across the country. So um, as I mentioned, uh, Bhutan started uh, using camera traps and the camera traps are a very popular tool for monitoring wildlife in Bhutan. And it's not just in Bhutan, but you know, across the uh, wildlife world, camera traps are very popular. And some of the reasons why camera traps are popular is because you know, um, it gives information, uh, it gives images or data that can be used in um, statistical tools, um, which are very robust. And the images that we get from these camera traps are, you know, very beautiful, very charismatic. Um, and then they serve as a very powerful medium for uh, um, influencing the policymakers and, you know, even the public into the conservation world. And then the bycatch images that we get from uh, the camera service, you know, if you are targeting uh, tigers, you also get pictures of leopards, you know, of herbivores and other species. So these also give very uh, important information about, you know, other sympatric species. But some of the um, disadvantages of, uh, or, or the challenges of using camera traps is, uh, is very logistically, logistically challenging, especially in the mountainous terrain like Bhutan, you know, um, all the camera trap stations, you know, you have to go there by by foot, and it's normally not accessible by road, so uh, it becomes very challenging. If you are, you know, in in the Bhutan case, if you are able to uh, set up two camera stations in a day, then that is a very uh, productive day. And then camera traps also requires a very uh, huge investment upfront. You know, the cameras cost uh, three hundred, four hundred, and five hundred dollars in in some of uh, the cameras where you know you need. Um, for monitoring species like the tiger, you need very good cameras so that you know the stripe patterns are well captured. So in that case, we need cameras that are expensive and that goes above 600, 700. So it's, it's a very um, expensive tool. And then it also provides limited information on connectivity. So it, it will give you information about tiger movement, tiger dispersal, but it, it gives no information about uh, gene flow. So on the other hand, um, another tool that is normally used uh, for monitoring wildlife population is non-invasive genetics. So even in case of non-invasive genetics, I'm sure most of our friends here who are watching this know that you know it gives it also gives you information um, that can be used in statistical um, tools and models and framework uh, that are very robust. But it's often uh, cost effective, and then it provides uh, information on connectivity and genetic health. And increasingly nowadays, you know, the genetics they play a very important role in uh, curbing uh, illegal wildlife trade. So some of the challenges uh, remain the cost in the laboratory, you know, because of genotyping error or you know poor um, DNA. So because of that, the cost gets um, escalated. And then uh, when you compare a picture of a tiger poop and a picture of a beautiful, you know, a, a tiger, whether it's in front of a public, in, in front of the public, or whether it's in front of a policymaker, so um, they they are less uh, charismatic. So in case of Bhutan, um, the research and conservation work that we do here are mostly funded by uh, the donor money, and then. Uh, you know, we don't always get that money and the limited amount of money that we get um, for monitoring key species like tigers, you know, we have to, we need a method that can uh, generate reliable quantitative data and be time efficient, be easily repeatable and affordable. So, so far we have been using camera traps. Now there is another alternative uh, of using non-invasive genetics. So, um, there is this potential of trying to see how uh, non-invasive genetics compare to camera traps, camera traps for estimating the density of uh, uh, key species like the tiger, uh, in my case. So uh, with that uh, thought in mind, I went on uh, to uh, use uh, non-invasive genetics and at the same time also use camera traps and trying to see how these two uh, methods compare for monitoring tiger populations in Bhutan. And to see that, uh, I went to the Royal Manas National Park. So the Royal Manas National Park is uh, an incredibly biodiverse um, region in the country and in, in South Asia. So uh, we placed camera traps there, um, about 101 camera stations. Uh, for the tigers, and we did that within that camera trapping array. We uh, embedded the uh, the scatter survey area as well. So um, 
if some of you here don't know how you know the camera traps can be used for monitoring tigers we all um, the tigers you know um, they have unique strap patterns on their body and uh, just like we say you know each human being has a different fingerprint so these tigers have unique strap patterns and then from the pictures that we get so these camera traps are um, like our eyes in the forest you know when especially in for in Bhutan forest when you are you when you are in the forest doing your field work you hardly see you know tigers um, leopards it would be a very rare encounter but you know when you leave the camera traps there when the animal passes in front of the camera it triggers the camera and then the camera takes uh, the picture so uh, you get uh, images like this and then these unique stripe patterns are unique to each individual tiger and then by comparing this we can know whether these are the same tiger or whether these are uh, different tigers for example if you look at these two pictures um, the, the prominent uh, mark you can see is on, on the left hind leg you can uh, hind leg you can see a number two you know so even in the right picture you can see the number two so by looking at these, uh, you can infer uh, whether these are the same tigers or whether um, they are different individuals. So even from the SCAT survey, what we do is um, um, the SCAT or the tiger poop become, becomes our source of DNA. So from the tiger poop, we extract DNA. And then from the DNA, we get a lot of very important information, like we can know with, um, whether these different SCATs belong to different individuals or whether they are the same individual and then you can also uh, know about their gender and then you can also know about the genetic makeup you know relatedness and you know it gives a lot of information so uh, the the data that we got from the camera traps and the non-invasive genetics uh, we um, use that data to estimate density under a spatially explicit capture recapture model so after having done that, um, in the camera traps, I, uh, I counted 22 tigers and a cup. Um, and then in the scat sampling, uh, our team walked 112 kilometers in uh, 14 days, and we got 61 putative uh, tiger scat samples. And out of that, uh, we got eight individuals, and five were males, and three were females. So um, using these data, I estimated the uh, density. And from the cameras, I got a density of 2.38 tigers per 100 kilometers square in uh, the Royal Manas National Park. And through the SCAT survey, I got a higher density of uh, 3.61 tigers per 100 kilometer square. But uh, if you look at the graph, you see that the confidence interval when I use the SCAT is uh, pretty huge. So which means it suggests that you know, the density that I estimated from the SCAT survey is less precise as compared to the cameras. But uh, these confidence intervals arise because uh, I, I think uh, these are arising because uh, the camera trap survey covered a larger area and then the sampling effort was also large while in case of uh, the SCAT survey we did it over you know 14 days and then the area covered was also big so because of that difference in the sampling effort these uh, there's the difference in this precision but so in order to address that we tried to control for the sampling effort uh, for, for the cameras and then we found that the density it, it again give a higher density than the SCAT and then the confidence interval was um, much higher. So um, from here we concluded that you know if you control for sampling effort then uh, probably the SCAT sampling will be um, will give you a reliable estimate as um, good as the gamma traps and for the same area the non-invasive genetics were, uh, was uh, four times cheaper. So that was um, how I looked at uh, the uh, use of non-invasive genetics for population monitoring purposes and at the same time also um, was looking at the, the genetic makeup. So here uh, you are seeing this map of uh, the tiger range. So the yellow portion represents the historical range and then the orange portion represents you know where they are currently found. So the tigers have lost um, like 93 percent of the historical range and the population have declined by over um, they are supposed to be uh, 100,000 tigers in the beginning of the early 20th century, but by the year 2015, and even now, they are less than uh, 4,000 tigers. So because of this huge you know, decline in population and this current populations being found in different isolated areas, um, it's important that we look at the genetic uh, aspect as well. So that was uh, what I wanted to look, um, to get in, uh, I wanted to get an idea about the genetic makeup of uh, tigers in Bhutan. So um, in the Indian subcontinent, uh, you, we see that, you know, the tigers have lost a lot of uh, genetic variation over the years. 
to an extent that you know some studies are saying that the Indian tigers, although they are increasing in numbers, but they face uh, extinction risk because of uh, the lack of uh, genetic uh, variation. So in Bhutan, um, as um, Somsa already mentioned, we have these uh, huge uh, well-connected, I mean, uh, well-connected protected area network and then this contiguous forested landscape. So when um, we have these uh, conditions, we would assume that, you know, the tigers must be moving freely and then there must not be anything, you know, that hinders their movement or their dispersal or gene flow. But uh, we also know that, uh, you know, Bhutan has these landscape features like this, you know, big mountains, big rivers, and the steep gorges that might act as a hindrance to tiger movement, and thereby also, you know, limiting uh, gene flow between different tiger populations, if there are any, um, like, within the country, subdivisions. So with that uh, in mind, um, I went on to try to uh, see uh, the level of uh, genetic variation that we have uh, in the tigers of Bhutan. So for that, I, um, I included the samples that I collected for the Royal Manas National Park. Um, so I had the six to one sketch samples from there. I also carried out some opportunistic sketch sampling uh, from the central and western Bhutan. And then I also got access, uh, thanks to the Nature Conservation Division and the department. Uh, I got um, 18 tissue samples from uh, 18 individuals, 16 were seized from illegal wildlife trade and then two from uh, natural death. So from here, um, I got a total of 24 individuals, uh, 12 were males and then 12 were females. And geographically, you know, I could, um, four of the samples were from the northern part of the country and then nine we got it from the south. And then, but for 11, we didn't know where they uh, come from, came from. So we used, uh, I, I used the expected heterozygosity as a measure of uh, genetic variation. And then although I'm limited by sample size, the, with the limited samples that I have, uh, I got an expected heterozygosity of uh, 0 0.75, which is uh, hi high and uh, which is good. And I did not observe uh, any specific geographic pattern in the uh, distribution of samples like um, no particular or no distinct uh, subdivisions within the country. So I used a tool called uh, DAPC, so a Discriminant uh, Principal Component Analysis. And uh, there I tried to assign these uh, different tigers based on their genetic makeup. And then uh, when we see here, the S is for the tigers that come from the south, the N represents the tigers that come from the north, and then U are those you know whose origin we did not know. And here each bar represents one uh, individual tigers. So you can see that you know the south, the north, and even the unknown, they are uh, genetically similar. You know you have this the green, orange, and the purple. So this represents you know different uh, tiger populations, or, or um, yeah subdivisions. So you, here you can see that, you know, they are genetically similar. So what is concerning here is that if you look at those seized tigers, you know, the, the tissues that I got from the seized tigers from the illegal wildlife trade, they are found to be genetically similar to the ones uh, in the north and to the south. So it could it suggest that maybe the tigers that are being poached are, can be from Bhutan or, you know, from the region. And another um, interesting finding is uh, the two unique individuals that you see in the south, the two orange uh, individuals, they had a very unique uh, genetic makeup when you compare to the other individuals. And from here, it suggests that these tigers might have come from um, a population very far away and uh, not uh, in the nearby region. So this becomes interesting because, you know, we are in this Eastern Himalaya landscape and then you have this Northeastern tiger population, a uh, very important tiger population. And then you have the Thai Ark landscape to the west, which is also home to, you know, so many protected areas and hundreds of our tiger population. But um, if you recall from uh, Samsa's presentation, you know, in, towards the southern part of uh, Bhutan, I mean, uh, to, to the Indian side, you have this um, a lot of people and then a lot of um, infrastructure, uh, deforestation, um, so which limits uh, tiger movement. And then the northeastern tiger population are found, are, are found to be um, a bit different as compared to the rest of the tigers in India. So our assumption here is that the two unique individuals that we found, it could have come from the Tariq landscape. And if it really did, then Bhutan can become a connecting link between the Tariq landscape and the, the northern, um, the northeastern uh, 
tiger population on the uh, Indian subcontinent. But to be able to say that, you know, it's really happening, um, we would need to embark upon the transboundary and landscape level uh, conservation approach using, uh, you know, common genetic data sets to understand uh, tiger dispersal, then threats and other factors that uh, influence the dispersal events. And for that, a few things we could do is we could uh, um, standardize uh, scoring of microsatellites, the, mark the genetic markers that we use for studying tigers, and then uh, for multiple studies of Bengal tigers, or we could also go for, you know, the more powerful and more easily standardized um, the, the markers known as uh, SNPs or single nucleotide polymorphism. So overall, um, yeah, you see that uh, Bhutan, you know, the tigers in Bhutan, they do not um, only seem to, sh to show a higher level of genetic variation, but we, you know, through the camera traps, we find that the tigers in Bhutan are, are breeding. From the 2015 uh, Nationwide Tiger Survey, we, they were, uh, we recorded about um, 60, um, tigers uh, and and I think female female tigers and through these camera traps uh, we are seeing evidences of tigers breeding. You know this is this footage is from Central Bhutan, um, and we also have footages of tigers from um, the northern part of the country. You know a tiger is leading three four cubs, and this footage um, or this camera trap picture is from uh, the Royal Manas National Park, and even there we see that uh, the tigers are breeding. So overall conclusion is that, you know, the, the tigers in Bhutan are well protected, they are breeding, and uh, Bhutan has a viable tiger population, and then Bhutan, Bhutanese uh, tigers are genetically diverse. So Bhutanese tigers could play a huge role in uh, tiger recovery and long-term persistence of tigers in the region, not only as a source of uh, tiger numbers, but also as a source of uh, genetic variation. And Bhutan uh, can, as a country, can be vital to genetic connectivity of tiger population in the not, uh, northeastern part of uh, the Indian subcontinent to um, the Tarak landscape and other parts. So uh, this research was possible with the help of uh, this uh, uh, supporters. So yeah, so that ends my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tashi, for uh, sharing the results of your valuable research. It was very, very informative. Um, I would request you to stop sharing your screen. Thank you. Uh, once again, I thank both the speakers uh, for giving us insights on their work. Uh, next up on our agenda is con conversation. Now we have uh, uh, a conversation with uh, Dr. Arun in conversation with Mr. Sonam Wangi and Mr. Tashi Bengo on uh, what Bhutan, sorry, what Bhutan teaches on elephant and tiger conservation to Asia. Arun Venkat Raman is a technical director at ERM, which is Environmental Resource Management. It is a global sustainability consultancy. He has a doctorate of philosophy in ecological sciences and has almost 35 years experience working for academic and conservation organizations. At ERM, Arun leads and advises biodiversity initiatives with emphasis on assessing and managing impact on threatened, endemic, restricted range, and migratory, congregatory species, protected areas, and other key biodiversity areas. Prior to ERM, Arun was Vice President for Sustainability at Olam International, Conservation Director of WWF Malaysia, and Sub-Regional Support Officer, citing Mike South Asia. Arun has extensive conservation and research experience in Bangladesh, Bhutan, Gabon, India, Nepal, Malaysia, and Sri Lanka. He is an author of several scientific papers, book chapters, popular articles, and scientific reports. So over to you, Mr. Arun, and to the uh, two speakers. Thank you. 
Thanks, uh, Aksha. Um, uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Am I clear? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, yeah, thanks for putting such an old photograph of me. I don't look like that any longer, unfortunately. <laughs> so that was a much, much younger days and uh, a pleasure to meet uh, both um, uh, Mr. Sonam and uh, Mr. Tashi. I'm very privileged to actually have uh, uh, this discussion. Um, I, you know, just uh, very briefly, I, uh, I was, as I said uh, in my resume, um, uh, the CITES, uh, uh, Mike, uh, uh, sub-regional support officer, uh, working with uh, several South Asian countries, which included Bhutan. And I had occasion to actually visit Bhutan um, 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 uh, several times. Um, in fact, I have, you know, uh, I'm, I'm very pleased that Mr. Sonam actually mentioned the Samsi, Samsi site because I probably spent quite a few days there, you know, training uh, staff on elephant monitoring techniques. So it was um, quite a privilege to actually go there. And I also had occasion to visit, visit Timpu for training of your um, officers there on elephant monitoring. So we actually drove from Timpu right down to uh, the Indian border, which was an eight hour drive, an absolutely fascinating drive from Alpine uh, kind of landscapes to uh, you know tropical and subtropical landscapes. So very, uh, very happy to actually be uh, talking to you. So, um, so I have a question firstly for uh, Mr. Sonam and um, this is actually related to this absolutely fascinating concept of this gross hap uh, happiness, uh, uh, gross national happiness index. And uh, I'm actually really wondering, and sorry, this is a bit of a philosophical question. I'm really wondering, you know, what relevance that has uh, when uh, managing um, uh, conflict with large animals such as uh, elephants? Um, you know, you probably have a whole range of issues with conflict ranging from elephants in the southern Bhutan um, to, um, uh, you know, uh, 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 leopards to uh, snow leopards in uh, the alpine areas, etc. Conflict is probably very, very relevant for Bhutan. So, you know, obviously having conflict is some kind of impact on livelihoods. And, uh, you know, the question is, how do you kind of factor this? in ensuring that your gross hap, uh, national happiness index is actually maintained. The second question very related is that given your strong tradition of earlier Bonism and then later Buddhism and the reverence you have for coexistence and nature, how does this feature in your uh, conservation programs, especially when you deal with communities, you know, like let's say, you know, a participatory management of elephant human conflict or, you know, uh, uh, participatory kind of enforcement along with local communities or intelligence uh, gathering uh, when it comes to wildlife trade. So if, if you can kind of just, uh, you know, uh, Mr. Sonam and, you know, uh, um, uh, Mr. Tashi also, if you can kind of contribute to that, I think that would make an interesting discussion. So um, Aksha, how much time do we have for this um, uh, discussion? Um, I think around 15 to 20 minutes. Okay, I'll, I'll keep within the limits. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Arun. Uh, thank you for the interesting question. And uh, like you said, a very philo philosophical question. Yeah, uh, in, terms of, uh, in terms of the conflict, yes, uh, we do face uh, a pretty much similar conflict uh, that uh, is being faced by the species and uh, humans uh, anywhere, uh, where, wherever there is elephants. So in terms of crop, crop damage, in terms of property damage, and sometimes even uh, human lives, although uh, we do have uh, very, very less uh, human deaths uh, because of elephants. We have uh, over the last uh, a decade or so, maybe one or two human deaths because of elephants. Uh, in terms of the, uh, how, in terms of your answering to your question, how does GNH feature in terms of dealing with uh, such conflict? So the concept of cross-national happiness uh, revolves, uh, it revolves ar around uh, nine domains, actually. Uh, the psychological well-being, the health, the time use, education, uh, cultural diversity, community vitality. So this is uh, uh, some of the uh, do uh, domains that I can remember. But Community vitality plays a major role, I would see, in terms of dealing with the conflict, uh, because uh, the level of community support that we have uh, whenever 
our neighbor is suffering uh, from the conflict, it plays a vital role in terms of uh, increasing the tolerance level towards the species, as well as, uh, like I was saying, because of the culture uh, reverence that we have for the species, uh, the tolerance level is uh, very much increased because of the uh, cultural re reverence. Uh, in the, the Buddhist culture, we uh, refer elephants as equivalent to a Buddha. And uh, uh, down south, uh, where we have Hindu, Hindu communities, like uh, all of you are, uh, must be aware, uh, elephant is referred as uh, uh, a form of Lord uh, Ganesha. So these things uh, do play a lot of uh, uh, role in terms of uh, increasing the tolerance level uh, when whenever uh, our communities are faced with conflict. But uh, uh, this said, uh, I would also like to say that uh, not every time our uh, farmers would be tolerant. Sometimes uh, when they are pushed to the limits, uh, they would uh, resort to towards uh, uh, resorting to some uh, uh, measures that uh, wouldn't actually support the species conservation as such. Uh, what was the uh, second question? Uh, well, I, I mean, I, I think that answers your question. And really, you know, I mean, uh, to sum it up, my question was, I mean, we also have traditional coexistence of conflict. And like you say, you know, in uh, Hindu communities, you know, the elephant is uh, revered as uh, God um, um, Ganesha and uh, uh, in the past and probably less right now people did kind of accept conflict as a part and parcel of life. But unfortunately, there's been a lot of pressure on elephant habitat. Elephants have actually probably become a lot more stressed uh, as a result, you know, human uh, mortality because of elephant conflict or, uh, you know, depredation of crops has probably actually increased, really eroding the uh, conflict levels. I, I mean, the, um, the coexistence um, 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 uh, level. So, um, but, you know, my, my thinking is that you probably haven't reached that stage in Bhutan. And I just wanted to kind of explore that, especially, you know, with this whole concept of coexistence you have in your very kind of embedded in your Buddhist philosophy, as well as your gross uh, national happiness index. So, uh, you know, the, if you can kind of give a, uh, a couple of sentences on that, I'll move on to my next question, you know. Okay, yeah. thank you. Uh, yeah. At least in terms of the coexistence, I would say... Uh, uh, we have not reached uh, to that level where India is at the moment. Uh, our uh, farmers uh, still do uh, river the elephants a lot. And then, uh, like, uh, I, I can uh, narrate uh, a story where I was interacting with a uh, lady, a, a farmer in the south, uh, uh, southeastern part of Bhutan. I was talking with her, uh, do you get, uh, do you suffer crop damages because of elephants? And then that lady was uh, like, uh, replying to me, yes, uh, elephant do visit our fields and bless my field uh, sometimes. Uh, and then I take it as a blessing and not as a crop damage. So at, at the moment, I would say uh, most of our uh, farmers, most of our communities, uh, they are at that level. But uh, how long can we uh, stay at that level? That is a big question, actually, because uh, uh, as more and more uh, 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 elephants are pushed into our territory because of the habitat degradation across yeah, the border. Yeah. I would uh, see uh, the conflict would increase day by day. And then uh, as the level of conflict goes up, uh, the, the level of tolerance would definitely come down because uh, the so, farmers uh, out here, they depend on agriculture for their livelihood. So uh, GNH, uh, GNH does play a role at the moment, but uh, how long will it play? <laughs> that that would be a big question, and only time time can answer that. Yeah, yeah, yeah I know. Okay, uh, let me actually move on to uh, I, from a philosophical to a slightly policy related question, and I will actually first request uh, Mr. Tashi to um, um, uh, uh, give us some thoughts on this, and then you know perhaps I'll come back to you, uh, Sonam. Yeah, uh, yeah. Mr. Tashi, that was an absolutely fascinating um, um, uh, presentation on your non-invasive techniques, especially looking at the genetic composition of um, uh, tigers across uh, Bhutan. The first question is uh, really, uh, I did get the impression that your northern tigers seem to be somewhat distinct, though you did say that they are actually similar uh, to um, 
um, uh, the ones in uh, the, uh, the South. And um, uh, I was actually wondering about that because, uh, you know, it will, do you think that if you have further investigations, you could really talk, think about um, a, a separate, what they call a genetic clade of tigers in North, which has very little kind of genetic uh, 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 gene flow between the Southern populations and the Northern populations. And really what we are talking about mountain tigers here, you know, which um, I mean, I'm, I, I'm always very surprised why tigers climb up so high. And I was just wondering whether, you know, you really have a very adapted, uh, 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 let's say, uh, uh, genome for that kind of high altitude living. And they're actually quite different from the southern uh, uh, population. And the second question is, you know, <clears throat> and um, uh, recently um, uh, in the 13th uh, COP uh, for the Convention for Migratory Species, the elephant was listed as, a, a, you know, an appendix one migratory species. And, uh, you know, I just like a couple of words from Mr. Sonam about how your transboundary efforts is uh, uh, facilitating that uh, uh, commitment. But uh, uh, so I'm also wondering about tigers, you know, is there a kind of uh, uh, chance in the future that we'll also get this as a migratory species, given that you have them from moving from the Therayak landscape in Northeast India. But let's get back to your first question uh, about the mountain tigers if i use a very unscientific uh, principle <laughs> yeah uh, thank you thank you so much for the question so uh in case of the uh, in, in in case of your first question whether the northern um the tigers um are you know distinct or different from the rest um in the beginning i also you know i i also had this uh, thinking uh that there is a gene flow uh, from the northern part of the country to the tiger population in the south and then not maybe from the south to the north. But because I was uh, limited by the sample size, I just had four individuals. So I couldn't really infer um, that the tiger population in the north is um, really uh, different from the south. So um, in the 2015 Nation Nationwide Tiger Survey, um, through the camera tribes, they found that you know during the survey period, no tigers from the northern part of the country were found in the south, and then no tigers from the southern part of the country were found in the north. So that was also one um, thing that, um, you know, that prompted me or that made me excited to do this genetic work. So I thought, you know, okay, no tigers from the north, north to the south and no tigers from the uh, south to the north. So maybe we have two different, uh, may, we may be having some uh, population subdivision. But then in, it was um, in 2015, I think, um, in one of uh, the camera surveys when we found that a tiger uh, from the Royal Manas National Park in the, you know, which is in, uh, in the southern part of the country, a tiger from there. I think the tiger was um, recorded there in 2012 or 10. And then the same tiger was recorded in 2015 in a in a national park called Jigmi Dorji National Park, which is way up in the north. So, you know, when we got that um, evidence, oh, okay. you know, yeah, so the tigers, okay. see that the tigers are moving. Um, and then, you know, when we are seeing that the, the green tigers, you know, that, that green genetic maker from the north in the south. So by looking at that, I feel there is gene flow and most probably there isn't a uh, uh, population subdivision or the northern tiger population isn't very different from the tiger from the rest of the country but to improve upon that i think you know i need i will need to do more sampling i will need to increase my sample size at least you know by uh, some studies uh, how some studies suggest i need to at least get like 30 individuals from the northern part you know and then maybe again get 30 individuals from the south and then try to really see whether yep, you know yeah, just yeah, yeah. genetic subdivision and then um Coming to your yeah. second question with regarding to the migratory species, I think the Department of Forest is already um, working with the Forest Department, um, and um, I think maybe even with few NGOs in the the Manas landscape, and they um, they have a project called the Tramka, uh, the Transboundary you know Manas Conservation Landscape, and then through that project, the the officials, uh, the foresters, the researchers in the Manas landscape towards Bhutan, we have you know few protected areas and territorial divisions and like the Royal Manas National Park, Pipsu Wildlife Sanctuary, um, Chomusanka Wildlife Sanctuary. So these um, different sanctuaries they collaborate with the Manas National Park in the Indian part. You know they do research activities, they monitor you know these transboundary tigers using camera traps, and then they also coordinate these uh, patrolling efforts. So the um, 
the start to to that um, uh, the transboundary collaboration, I, I think is already there. And then um, I feel like with you know tiger being um, a species that migrates over hundreds of kilometers, I just think it's just important, like I mentioned in my presentation, to get a very good idea about their dispersal events, or you know even when you are trying to see about um, their um, getting you know using that information to help. Uh, curb the tiger illegal poaching and the trade. You know, I think the researchers and then the uh, the um, the depart forest department from across these three different countries, you know, Nepal, India, Bhutan. I think we need to um, do something bigger to protect the species. Just to, Arun, this uh, is thanks. Uh, this is uh, John Singh speaking. And uh, Mr. Sonam, you want to have quickly kind of, uh, yep, yep. Yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Uh, John Singh, Dr. John Singh. Yeah. Okay. You know, there's a joke or a very interesting uh, statement about uh, Bhutan tigers. You know, they have breakfast in uh, Royal Manas, then they have lunch in uh, Igme Singhe or the Black Mountain National Park. Then they have dinner in uh, Jigme you know, Because of the good connectivity created by this biological <laughs> corridor and everything, it's possible for the tiger to move from, I mean, uh, Royal Manas to Jigme is very easy. So the connectivity and this uh, other big national park recently created that also well connected to uh, Jigme Dorji. So overall, you know, the connection is exceedingly yeah. good. And that's the point I wanted to. Yeah, we you will have to have big. You'll have to have big breakfasts, lunches, and dinners to walk distance. I suppose it's quite far. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, coming back to Mr. Sonam, uh, the uh, question about. Okay, well, this is the last question, and I'll you know give you thoughts. About the the uh, uh, listing of the. Uh, yeah. Uh... Yeah, I think they are losing Arun's voice. Okay. Uh, anyways, I think uh, I got uh, what uh, okay. Dr. Arun wanted to ask. So, listing of uh, elephant as appendix one in the CMS yeah. during the COF 13. So how does it impact? Uh, of course, Bhutan is not a party to uh, CMS, but uh, we are uh, in the process of uh, accessing, uh, uh, getting access uh, to the CMS as uh, as a party. And uh, yes, definitely, uh, the transboundary collaboration works that uh, Tashi just mentioned uh, that is happening at the local level. But uh, we. At the, uh, at the national level, we want to formalize this, and that's uh, the main idea or the main reason uh, behind why we are proposing uh, for the Indo-Bhutan Peace Park or the Friendship Park uh, that uh, uh, we are proposing to be uh, developed in this landscape is mainly to facilitate uh, the movement of uh, such uh, migrating species like elephants and tigers. So uh, uh, definitely uh, the work that we are planning or we are already doing at the ground level is uh, going to contribute a lot to uh, uh, facilitating the movement of this species. Uh, yes, and then definitely uh, elephant being listed. Uh, I, I was actually there to, uh, when this uh, COP was happening. I was in Gujarat uh, attending the COP and then I was really, really happy because I went there to give a presentation on the Peace Park, uh, the proposal for indo Bhutan Peace Park and uh, why we are proposing for this. And then uh, that's that's why I uh, said that elephant as the foundation of the friendship, uh, like uh, uh, depicted in the murals, the wall murals of the four harmonious friends, we want elephant as uh, the focal species or the foundation of friendship between Bhutan and India uh, to take forward uh, the, uh, uh, the intention of uh, facilitating the movement uh, as already uh, and researched by the uh, CMS Corp Hutton. Thank you, Arun. Yeah, what a fantastic, 
beautiful idea. I hope it collectively increases all our gross national happiness in the future. Thanks so much. Uh, Thank you, uh, Thank Mr. Sonam and Mr. Tashi. Um, Akshay, I'll hand it over back to you. Uh, it's very, we could have continued to discuss this the whole night, but <laughs> unfortunately, we are limited in time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Arun, for taking this forward. It was a very, very interesting con uh, conversation. And uh, I'm sure many of us had similar questions and thoughts. And to take this forward, uh, I would now uh, move in, uh, request the moderator to move in to the question answer session. Um, OK, uh, so the last uh, part of our event is the question and answer session with Mr. Sona Mondi and Mr. Tashi Benduk, which is mod which will be moderated by Ankul Shetty. Ankul is an IT consultant and a wildlife photographer. And uh, over to you, Ankul, to take this forward. Thank you, Aksha. Thank you. All right, so thank you so much, uh, uh, Sonam and Tashi. Very good presentation. Uh, I hope my voice is audible. OK, all right, so there are many questions. Uh, so let me take one by one. So there is one from Narendra. Uh, to Mr. Sonam, uh, he wants to know that you mentioned there are no long migrations of elephants. So is this because of uh, habitat fragmentation or is there any other reason for uh, no long migration of elephants? And how long have you collected the caller data to have to arrive at that kind of information? Thank you, Uncle. Uh... I was going through the chat and I had already directly answered uh, uh, Narendra, okay. but uh, for the information of everyone, the elephants were, call uh, I call it six elephants and uh, the, caller, uh, the callers stayed on the elephants for about uh, maximum two years. Uh, so one of the callers did manage to stay uh, beyond two years, but uh, uh, my one and a half to two years and the reason for no long migration, I would say, is basically uh, because of the food availability that is there in the landscape, because of uh, which they don't feel the need to migrate over long distances in, to, uh, in search of food. And uh, in the uh, landscape where I did the coloring, there isn't much of a, uh, an habitat fragmentation. Where, uh, wherever there is habitat fragmentation on the Botanist side, there is a con contiguous habitat uh, on the Indian side. And then uh, wherever there are settlements on the Indian side, we, we do have a forested area on the Botanist side. So this does provide a contiguous habitat in order to facilitate migration. But uh, even though there is a contiguous habitat, I, like I uh, mentioned in my presentation, uh, I haven't uh, come across uh, 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 an elephant that I call it uh, that has migrated long distance. Uh, so at the most from one park to another, uh, uh, I, the, I would say it, uh, it could be mainly because of the uh, foot availability that is already there in the landscape. Yeah. All, right. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Dr. Marine uh, wants to know. Uncle, uh, uncle, uh, uncle, uh, sorry, mm -hmm. related to this, I would like to ask Sonam, I mean, how many males he radio colored and how many females? Was there any difference between the ranging pattern of this male and female related to what we spoke right now? Thank you, Dr. Uh, John Singh, uh, for the question. I call it uh, four females and two males. It was all an opportunistic coloring operation because uh, whatever we came across, we uh, captured and then called. Uh, thanks to Dr. Sukumar for guiding me uh, over the coloring operation uh, initial uh, Three elephants uh, I did under his supervision, but uh, the later uh, part, uh, the, the last three elephants I did of my own. Uh, yeah, uh, basically that was the uh, sex segregation: uh, two two males and four females. Uh. No, but major difference in the ranging pattern between the male okay. and the female. Uh, in terms of the uh, ranging difference, I found that uh, males they do range, uh, they do have a larger home range. So 100 to 150 was for females, and then uh, uh, close to 600, uh, one was even uh, traveling around six, 600 square kilometers uh, in its home range. That was uh, one of one of the males. So basically, females uh, travel less less than uh, males. Yeah. 
Okay, Dr. Ejit Johnson. Thank you, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, doctor, thank you. So let's let's move on to the second question. Uh, so second question asks that, okay, you mentioned that tigers and elephants are a part of the culture and religion. So is that one of the main reasons for the conservation uh, or, you know, having highest number of tigers and elephant density in Bhutan or? Yeah, community support uh, in, in terms of the traditional reverence that we have, uh, like uh, I was mentioning when I was talking about the uh, tolerance level uh, when it comes to the human elephant uh, coexistence. So uh, it does play a, a lot of uh, role. Uh, it does. Uh, we do have to consider this as one of the important factors that uh, supports conservation uh, in general and not uh, specific to elephants, but uh, uh, traditional reverence the, for environment and for uh, species do play a major role in terms of conservation conservation of this species, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Akash Deep uh, from uh, WII Dehradun and ISR Pune, uh, he says, great presentation, and uh, uh, he wants to know the interconnected TAs uh, explain the most of the scenario. Our work in North Bengal, so he's referring to his work in uh, North Bengal, could be compared and the interconnectedness might come out, of a, come out as a prominent factor. I wonder if you could provide some statics on the number and type of conflicts, electric fences, alcoholism, among other factors. Thank you, uh, Akash Tip. Uh, <laughs> the same as uh, the earlier uh, question, this also I had replied privately to him, but uh, for the uh, general purpose, uh, purpose of general understanding to everyone. Uh, Yes, the interconnectedness of the uh, landscape does play a major role uh, in terms of... Uh, so I i am aware of what they are trying to do in the North Bengal site because of uh, the heavy infrastructure, the linear infrastructure, as well as the, uh, uh, the towns and settlements that uh, is there in the uh, North Bengal, how, how it affects the elephant migration. So in terms, uh, in terms of the interconnectedness, yes, um, uh, it can be compared. And then uh, the uh, role that it plays, like I said, uh, it plays a major role uh, for the uh, migratory species. In terms of the providing the uh, statistics, in terms of number of conflict, we do come across a lot of conflict in terms of crop damage, in terms of property damage. And like I said, very less uh, human deaths uh, 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 okay, uh, so we have uh, initiated electric fences as early as 2009 to 10. That was the, uh, even before that, we had electric fences to prevent uh, human elephant conflict, but uh, some of the electric fences uh, that is owned by the communities, it does uh, play a major role in preventing the conflict, but uh, some electric fences uh, like all of us out here are aware how intelligent the animal that uh, we are talking about today is, uh, how they can uh, very easily uh, get across the electric fences uh, using wooden poles uh, or just uh, grab a tree and throw it over the electric fences. So uh, even in Bhutan, yes, uh, we are learning uh, in the process of installing electric fences and uh, various other uh, measures in terms of preventing the conflict uh, and the second question uh, about, uh, uh, is it about the leopard, common leopard? Yeah, that was the second question, I believe. But I think uh, Akash Deep uh, Roy has a uh, question yes, to yeah. ask. Akash Deep, yes, you could. You could yes, yes. I'll, I'll make it quick. Uh, so, sir, uh, thank you very much for the presentation. So, I, just, I was just wondering, you know, uh, you said they were just, if you talk about human deaths, so they were just two human deaths in the last, couple of decades in Bhutan, right? Was it the number? Yes, yes, yes. yes. So, uh, contrasting, contrastingly, in North Bengal, there are almost 70 deaths per year caused by uh, caused by the Asian elephants, which is like, like quite a difference, right? So, I was wondering that, you know, since the uh, fragmented protected areas in North Bengal, they are interspersed with tea gardens. And they don't have a corridor as they do in Bhutan. Mm -hmm. So, this, this makes a lot of difference. And secondly, the electric fences, I just wanted to know, I mean, since the conflict is low in Bhutan, so is it the electric fences 
they are make they are, are they playing a critical role in there i mean are they controlling the conflict or is it like the elephants are you know taking the other way around yeah, electric fences like i said earlier it does play yeah. a role in preventing the conflict but uh, uh, like uh, i was mentioning uh, it is very difficult to overcome the intelligence of the animal so electric fence at at a certain point of time they do serve the purpose of preventing the conflict but uh, elephants do learn very easily in fact uh, uh, this year it may prevent the conflict but next next year they learn some level of, uh, some kind of uh, measures or some uh, how to overcome those fences definitely but, uh, yeah, definitely. i agree yes. role now, in preventing so now so now when you compare conservation between bhutan and india you have to take into account the human population density yeah. you have yes. 30 people per square kilometer density maybe in north bengal 500 600 people per square kilometer that will explain and you yes. should keep your population low that's very very important otherwise you can't have 60% forest cover in future okay you have to keep your population under control don't breed too much actually thank thank you dr johnson <laughs> yes that's that's right thank you uh, so human density it, it does play a major role in uh, terms of uh, elf deaths due to and uh, any kind of conflict uh, be it elephants or be it tigers uh, so uh, compared to india uh, <laughs> we very, we are in terms of density we are very very less in fact so that that, that is a major uh, factor why we come across very less uh, human deaths you should not follow the model of your fourth king <laughs> in number of children <laughs> the <laughs> king is fine <laughs> okay <laughs> hello all right yeah and and then yes uh, let me read out the second question as well for for the audience also uh, so uh, akash deep once again asks uh, that leopard is considered as one of the notorious uh, cat in india or a predator in india uh, is it the same status in bhutan is it a problematic species also that in terms of you know invading to people territory and yeah tashi do you want to take this question since it's related to cats or do i take it tashi um um can you hear me la yes yes, yes yes yeah so in my place right now we had a little bit of rain and then um we just lost the light the electricity so i couldn't really um get, get yes this the question, question to fix. the question is uh, leopards are a uh, notorious or problematic uh, species cat in india uh, you know where it invades or it, it gets into the village and creates trouble for people is it the same in bhutan was the question um yeah from the different um the cases of human wildlife conflict especially with regard to to livestock depredation um in bhutan you know data shows that um common leopards are uh, one of the four predators of you know like the prime predators responsible for livestock depredation in bhutan um along with tigers and then you have the snow leopard and then you also have the bears so yeah so common leopards are to some extent um uh, problematic to people but uh, not 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 as uh problematic as it is in india so the i think the name common leopard uh, i think is more relevant to india because it's most common to see leopard by the settlements but uh, here in bhutan uh, it's very rare to see a leopard or uh, for that uh, purpose even uh, other wildlife uh, by the settlements uh, but uh, we do come across occasional uh, human leopard conflict uh, in terms of livestock depredation you I, have I, more I, conflict again, with the black bear you know i mean yes. correct you have more conflict with the black bear and in fact uh, tashi uh, is undertaking he he is just initiating a black bear uh, survey in terms of uh, humans uh, perception towards black bear conservation and then tashi i think uh, you can talk more on that if you want uh lasla isla <laughs> um so human and black bear is uh, one of the uh, problematic species here in bhutan you know people come um into conflict with the species a lot you know they um 
for example, in case if you're talking about tigers and leopards, you know, they just depredate on livestock. But in case of uh, the bears, because they are an omnivore species, they eat your uh, cattle calf or yak calf, and then they also depredate on your crops, and then they also break into your homes, you know, um, eat your um, food. The, the Especially like in the northern part of the country, we have people that store you know their groceries whether it's groceries or rice you know for over the winter and then the bears they break in and they you know do a lot of property damage so black bears are a very um like prime conflict species in bhutan and with the study um you know jikmin Dorji national park um they I, I did a survey there uh, for one of my colleagues at the office and then you know when i interviewed people they told me that human wild um, their conflict with bear is very intense. And then that um, led me to um, do this uh, survey there in Jigmundorji National Park. So there I'm trying to look at two different things. First one is I'm trying to look at uh, the local perception of uh, the, the people towards uh, human and, uh, Himalayan black bear. And then using non-invasive genetics, I'm also trying to count the number of uh, bears there. And you know, in one of the instances when I was asking questions to the villages, you know, I was just asking them, how many bears do you think there are in your locality? So they were saying, uh, I think there must have been, uh, there are around 200 or 300 bears you know, which is not possible. So there is a big um, gap between, you know, the perceived risk and then the actual risk. So with this perception survey and with the population monitoring using non-invasive genetics, I'm trying to see uh, what the actual picture is. And from the findings, I'm hoping that it will, you know, help to inform um, decisions and, you know, policies and so on. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tashi. I think we will be excited to look at the uh, outcome of this project. All right, uh, before we could move on to the questions we have for Tashi, uh, one question for you, Sonam, uh, because we spoke a lot about how uh, transboundary uh, efforts has to be uh, implemented, how India and Bhutan should work together for conservation and such. Right? So I was recently in Manas, uh, uh, and I do understand the old trade route that passes Manas and that crosses the border to Royal Manas, right? We see a lot of human uh, movement inside the national park, uh, inside the tiger reserve. What's your opinion on that? I mean, should we look at an alternate route for trade between Bhutan and India? Or what's, what's, what's your thought about that? Uh, do you mean uh, Bhutanese, lots and lots of Bhutanese people uh, using that trade route or? A lot of Indians as well use it. I don't, I don't see really a trade route, a trade route as such, but in India, a lot of people are using their private vehicles to come inside the forest until the border, the Bhutan border uh, for, you know, mm -hmm. recreational purposes, for example. Yeah. Right? yeah. But then you know, that road, unfortunately, cannot be closed because it's a trade road between India and Bhutan. Yeah, uh, we do, uh, like you said, when I visited Manas, I came across lots and lots of Indian cars uh, taking safari uh, trips into the uh, Manas National Park. Uh, yeah, this can cause uh, disturbance to the wildlife, but uh, uh, like you were mentioning, this being a trade route and then the only connectivity uh, that is being uh, uh, provided to the people uh, of Bhutan towards uh, northern side of the Manas National Park, I don't think uh, there can be uh, any other options uh, because... Uh, Yes, it does pass through, right through the uh, two national parks, the Manas National Park and the Royal Manas National Park. But uh, how do we actually uh, create awareness uh, to those travelers? That would be more important than uh, trying to find an alternative route. Right. Or maybe, maybe you know, the trade routes can continue, but uh, no, there should be some restrictions on recreational tourists who can take their private vehicles inside the park, maybe. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Is there a night traffic? Do people travel at night also, Sonam? Uh, uh, no. Actually, I did see some people traveling in night as well. That's because, uh, you know, there is a guest house inside the national park, the Matanguri guest house. And uh, people who stay inside the Matanguri uh, sometimes, you know, can take their vehicle and travel uh, within the park. So, that's, that, that's, I, I, that, I, I, night safaris. That should be banned, actually. That should be totally banned. <laughs> Not just that, uh, doctor, you know, uh, uh, you know, even if a private vehicle is allowed inside, there should be someone from the forest department who is, you know, uh, probably uh, 
you know, with them because I have seen a lot of people getting down from the vehicle, taking a selfie with the elephants and rhinos, you know, uh, uh, and honking, playing music. So that is something very disturbing to see. Really I thought uh, it was always an escorted uh, safari. Not on anymore. <laughs> but uh, on the Bhutanese side, uh, we don't have uh, safari trips as such, uh, and we don't intend to <laughs> introduce one to. Right. The uh, sustainable form of uh, uh, ecotourism uh, we would love to promote and then make some uh, level of uh, revenue for the park uh, to finance the conservation activities inside the park. But it has to be controlled and sustainable. Agreed. All right. Yes, I think we should move on because this is one thing we can keep talking about all the time. Right. All right. So there are uh, some questions to Tashi. Uh, so let me take this one from Ifin. Uh, she says, is it possible to narrow down the, the confidence interval for population estimation using SCAT by repeating field sampling for SCAT, SCAT collection and by increasing the number of recapture? Uh, Mr. Tashi? Can you, can, yeah, can you um, repeat the last sentence? Like, uh, re Recaptures and what was by the, uh, by repeating the field sampling for scat mm -hmm. collection and increasing oh. the number of recaptures. Yeah, so um, the traditional way of uh, doing this, um, the mock recapture method is, uh, you know, it's done with the camera traps right now. Is you know you have these different intervals between when you um, like in 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 uh, the mock recapture. Uh, language you call it um, the occasions you have these occasions so with the non-invasive genetics that I used here you know I did one single site visit field sampling so during that time you know I go to the field and then within the survey period I collect whatever I get and then based upon that you know there are some ways I can um, get the data into a format which can be used in um, that uh, model but you know in terms of uh, the camera traps you are keeping that uh, camera traps over a longer period of time and then you have several occasions so you can increase that occasion in uh, non-invasive genetics as well for example you know you do you do an entire sweep uh, once and then you you know leave a gap for maybe a week or you know 10 days and then again you go again you do a sweep and then you can repeat that so if you repeat that, you can increase your uh, number of recaptures. So um, with that, the question about um, decreasing the confidence interval. So, you know, if you get a lot of recaptures, then the, the precision of your um, the density estimate will be higher. So, you know, increasing your sampling effort, increasing your sampling area, and then, you know, sampling effort as in, you know, the number of times you visit the field and then um, that will all help to increase the recapture. And then in turn, it will help to increase that, uh, I mean, decrease or narrow down that uh, confidence interval. But collection of scats in Bhutan will be very, very tough. Am I correct, mm -hmm. Rashid? Yeah, so um, that's true. Um, in Royal Manas National Park, uh, previously, uh, before anybody actually really did a uh, uh, SCAS survey, you know, dedicated SCAS survey, I um, talked to a few people there and then they said that, you know, it's very rare that you would be seeing um, or getting a tiger scats. But, you know, um, as compared to what they were saying, I got the scats like, you know, much, I, I mean, in numbers, much better numbers than what I had expected. But, you know, the weather, the moist, the moisture, the rain, especially if you do it in, um, like I, I did the scare survey in Feb February, but uh, there were a lot of rain and then it, it is difficult, it is challenging, but you know, it's a very promising tool. So that's why I'm, you know, all the time trying to promote this um, tool as for, you know, as a tool for monitoring wildlife populations in Bhutan. So there is a question on that as well by Vivian. So he asks uh, if the SCAT sample that needs to be collected need to have meet certain condition, you know, to ensure that the data is uh, accurate. For example, should it be a fresh SCAT that should be collected within a day? Or, uh, you know, is it also possible that uh, it could be mistaken that the SCAT of another wild cat is mistaken to be that of a tiger? So is that a possibility or... Yeah, so when we are doing non-invasive genetics, it is very important to ensure that we, you know, 
give all those conditions or meet all those con conditions that increases the DNA amplification success while in the lab, while you are, you know, um, extracting the DNA and doing all the PCR. So that will include, like um, he mentioned, you know, um, we should try to as much as possible get fresh scats because the old scats, you know, they are weathered, weathered down by rain, you know, the sun, and then the DNA, amount of DNA that is available there, there which can be extracted and used you know, is very poor. So you get a uh, very good DNA from uh, the fresh scats. And then it will also depend on, you know, how you are storing your scat, you know, the, the, the scat samples. And then um, if you are keeping your uh, scat samples in a very poor condition, then that will lead to degradation of the DNA. And, you know, if you take that scat sample to the lab, again, you get very uh, less amount of DNA, a very poor, you know, quality of DNA. And another thing is, you know, the time between... Uh, the collection of scats and the time when you are doing the DNA extraction. So if that time period is also, you know, very long, and then, you know, over that time, if you're not storing it in a very good condition, like, you know, in um, ultra G freezes, like minus 40, minus 60, minus 80, then again, the source of DNA, you know, because the, the quality becomes very poor. So less uh, poor quality of DNA and then, you know, less amount of DNA will mean that, you know, very low amplification success. And with regarding to the misidentification, um, people are, you know, in the field, they are experienced with regarding to, you know, identification of scars, but still then there are instances where you misidentify them. I think uh, there are a few papers that looks at, you know, what are the percentages of, you know, human error when we are trying to do um, scat identification. So, yeah, so therefore, even if you misidentify a scat, um, you can always take it to the lab and then you can do the species ID. Of course, it will mean, you know, um, an increase in the lab laboratory cost, but there is a way um, you can verify whether the scat I collected is, um, whether it belongs to tiger or whether it belongs to a leopard. Got it. All right. There's also one more question about the same thing, you know, uh, uh, tiger being a predator, you know, the question is that, it, the DNA could have uh, contained more than uh, information of more than two species because it's a predator, right? Uh, so can that also be a factor for not having accurate data or no, that is ruled out? Yeah, so um, like when we are doing this non-invasive sampling for a particular species, uh, we use uh, certain uh, genetic markers. That, um, uh, by genetic markers, we uh, target a specific part of the DNA sequence of that particular species. So um, we use several of those markers that are like specific to a species or, you know, a, a similar uh, group of species. So when we do that over, you know, several, we call those markers as microsatellites, the ones that I used. So we do that comparison over uh, several microsatellites and then you can, you know, be able to say whether um, it's a tiger or whether it's a, a leopard. So, um, when we target a specific part of the DNA sequence, um, this uh, I think um, it it rules out um, of uh, you know getting um, actually amplifying the DNA of uh, some other species in the, um, the 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 scatter the poop. Okay, and and uh, is there a DNA sequence change or any prominent change as uh, you have uh, uh, you know monitored across different elevations uh, or no, I, I haven't looked at that. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. Uh, there is another question from Sunandana Dev. Uh, I, I hope uh, both the speakers are uh, willing to take more questions or if you guys are out of time, I think we can conclude or uh, what do you feel? Can we take this couple I of more questions? Can, uh, yeah. Uh, last uh, two or about two questions. And then mm -hmm. we... Okay. All right. So perfect. So this, this question is by uh, Sunandana Dev. Uh, it was an excellent presentation by both the speakers. My question is that uh, genetic diversity who said to be at 0.75, but is it due to two genetically different tigers, which increase the sample average? Yeah. So uh, when I said um, that, you know, to individuals had unique multilocus genotypes of course they uh, did give you know a, a number of different uh, uh, alleles but when we are looking at heterozygosity i think um, 
it, it depends not only upon the number of alleles per locus that we get, but it also depends upon the abundance of those alleles. So as far as I can remember, I think I tried um, looking, uh, taking out those two um, individuals out of the population and again, trying to look at the expected heterozygosity, but uh, it didn't make a lot of difference. Okay. Thank you, thank you. All right, there's one question from uh, uh, to Sonam. Uh, what about using beehives to scare the elephants away? Elephants act uh, very respectful to the humming of bees and uh, this could also uh, create a revenue with honey for the villagers. Is that considered or is that been used in Bhutan for elephant, <coughs> keeping the elephants away? Thank you, Uncle. Uh, uh, yes. The beehive fence uh, that uh, people commonly talk about, uh, I think it's more successful in Africa, African situation mm -hmm. where the bees are aggressive, more aggressive, and the honeybees that we raise the, uh, at home, those are not that aggressive uh, to drive away elephants. Mm -hmm. I did uh, try uh, one in, uh, pilot, uh, as a pilot study, I did try installing uh, some beehives along the fences, uh, but uh, it, it was not that effective uh, in terms of uh, driving the elephants away, but of course, producing honey, yes, definitely. And uh, yeah, incre increasing the taste of their breakfast, <laughs> yes. <laughs> but uh, uh, thank the, you so much. These out here, that uh, they are not uh, that effective as it is in the African situation. The black bears, the the, sorry, the black bears were not raiding the big hives? Uh, it was tried down in the south. So in, in the south, uh, we don't have uh, that much, uh, that many black bear conflict or the black bears coming into the village settlements is not uh, very frequent in the south. The India also they tried with the big hives. It is not successful. They are not very aggressive like the African bees. You know, that's the reason. <laughs> All right, so thank you so much. Uh, this is all about the questions. I have one uh, rather a comment or a thought maybe uh, we could use this as the last one. Ex excellent discussion and presentation. Very proud to be neighbors to the Royal Bhutan Kingdom. Having volunteered with elephant census operations in India, would love to volunteer across Bhutanese landscape. Uh, Girish uh, says that. So is there an, is there an opportunity for, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, Indians to participate or volunteer in any uh, any such uh, scenarios in Bhutan. Till now, we didn't get such volunteers, but uh, we could always uh, try to see how we can accommodate uh, because uh, we need to travel deep into the forest and then uh, stay in the forest. So, uh, uh, yes, definitely, uh, we would love uh, to have volunteers, but uh, there would be the uh, issue of immigration and these things uh, coming into and it uh, goes inner inner parts of uh, Bhutan. So uh, I do see an opportunity where we could uh, collaborate together. Yes. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much, both of you. Uh, that is all the questions. Uh, Aksha, over to you for uh, the closing note. Thank all you. the best to Sonam and Trashi. Thank you, Dr. John Singh. How are you? I'm fine. I'm fine. <laughs> good. Good to hear that. Uh, thank you, Uncle, for moderating the session. I would also like to thank the two speakers once again and Mr. Arun for giving us their precious time to make this event insightful, informative, and powerful. I also thank all the participants for their interest and their questions. Thank you to all the people working behind the scenes. Naveen for organizing this event and for the smooth functioning of this event. Uh, you can find this uh, session on Facebook and upload it on YouTube later. With this, we close the session. I wish all of you to be safe. Thank you and good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Aksha. And stay safe, everyone in India. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Namaste. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.